is only composed of men or only composed of women when you are taking decisions about hiring. Now what that means as you get more senior in the organisation is that um, panels are often looking for what I call token woman. They need, to, they need a panel and they need a woman on it and they look around and they think, where do you find women? And my last job was in HR, which is where you tend to find more women. So I'd often get asked to be part of interview panels. And as part of that, I had to sort of decide how many to do because I could have spent most of my time sitting on interview panels. So I had a rule that I would only go on a panel if it was with interesting people that I hadn't come across before or for jobs that I thought were interesting. Anyway, I was approached by our High Commissioner here in Pakistan, who I'd never met before, and he said, hey, I'm trying to recruit my Deputy High Commissioner in Islamabad, and I need a final panel member who's a woman. And I thought, well, High Commissioner to Pakistan, that's a very senior role. Um, he, I've heard great things about him, I've never met him. Okay, I'll be on that panel. And because I don't like just sitting there not saying what I think. I gave my views in the interview process because I thought it was important. And actually the High Commissioner and I got on. He liked the way I thought. He thought I had an interesting perspective. Anyway, about nine months later, this job here in Karachi was advertised. And I'd said to myself, I, was, I could never work somewhere like Pakistan. Someone like me couldn't work in a, in a city like Karachi. I don't, I, I, wouldn't, I don't know what I would, I don't have the skills on paper. But the advert came round. And instead of say, deleting that email and saying, no, I'm not going to try for it, I opened the advert and I thought, wow, that job looks amazing. It looks like a fantastic role. The city looks amazing. It's doing some really important stuff. On paper, I'm really not the right fit, but do you know what? In a fit of bravery, I thought, I'll email the High Commissioner and said, I don't know if you remember me, but I was on a panel with you a little while ago, and uh, I saw you're advertising your job in Karachi. And he called me up and he said, you're interested in Karachi. And I said, whoa, 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 I, I, I don't know. I don't think I could do the job. And we talked and he said, look, you know, there's nothing to stop you applying. You know, you, you may not have what you think is the right experience. It's going to be a real competition, but don't think that just because you haven't got some skills on paper that you shouldn't apply for a job. And so I did, rather against my better judgment. Anyway, after a very, very stressful interview involving four people and a deeply grueling hour of my life that, that terrified me. I was lucky enough to be offered that job. My point is, it's not the fact that I was appointed because I was a woman. It was the fact that we had a policy that said you can't have single gender interview panels, which led me to making a connection with someone who had much more power and influence than me who then encouraged me and who then took a risk in appointing me. You know, he said, actually, this person isn't the best fit on paper, but I believe she can do it. And so that's why I'm saying to the men in the room, think about your power and your privilege and use it to empower others. Because actually, whether you're CEOs or CFOs or members of the board or heads of department, the people you reach out to, the people you invite to meetings, the people whose voice you listen to, that in itself has a huge power and impact. And for the women in the room, support each other, champion each other. I know that I rely on a network of amazing women. And I, in Pakistan, I've been privileged to meet some totally phenomenal women. This country has some of the most brilliant, most feisty, most ambitious women I have ever come across in all fields. So tonight it's accountancy, but it's been Formula One racing, it's been neurosurgery, it's been filmmaking, it's been science, it's been technology, it's been innovation. There are amazing women in this country. Those stories don't always get told. Champion each other, champion your voices, 
and um, thank you once again for inviting me to this event this evening. Uh, thank you, Ellen. Uh, yes, listening to each other, that's very important. And sharing with each other uh, the ideas and thoughts is important. Uh, can I please call on stage uh, ICAP president, Mr. Jafar Hussain, to come and give a shield and a gift hamper from Unilever and a gift hamper from National Foods. Please, can we have you? Okay, so when I was at Unilever and as the Corporate Finance Director, it was not just about diversity as a strategy or having an environment of inclusion. It's about creating a culture of belonging where anyone can walk into the workplace and feel compare, uh, comfortable. That means having more of everything surrounding you. I believe that the flipping point for belonging is a minimum 30% female representation at every level. As Ellen just mentioned, they're almost there at that level. We will now have a panel discussion which will dwell upon the fact why women are not able to pursue their professional careers despite achieving top positions in their academic life and also to deliberate how to accelerate the process of more women into leadership roles. We have a diverse panelist comprising of Asim Siddiqui, Ms. Sadia Khan, Ms. Fareen Salman, Mr. Faraz Khan, and Ms. Saira Khan. Our very own Ms. Muniza Bhatt will moderate the session. I would now like to call her on stage, Ms. Muniza Bhatt. Muniza is multi-talented and as partner KPMG has the honor of being the first female in one of the big four audit and advisory firms in Pakistan. Muniza is truly a woman of inspiration having won several accolades as one of the 100 Pons Miracle Women by Unilever, a woman of inspiration by Ladies Fund, one of the 18 Powerful Women in Business by Profit Magazine and CA Woman of the Year by ICAP. She's a writer, speaker, promotes gender diversity at various platforms at ICAP. Women on Board, Global Lean, In Movement. Muniza, please come on stage and introduce your panel. Thank you. Bismillah rahman rahim Thank you, Hurshid, for the kind introduction. I think Ellen's speech has set the tone for the evening, and now we shall take it forward with a panel discussion on Balance for Better, which is the theme for the International Women's Day 2019. I would like to reiterate what uh, Hurshid spoke in the beginning, that balance is not just a women issue. It's a business issue. The race is on for gender-balanced boardrooms, gender-balanced government, gender-balanced media coverage, a gender balance of employees, more gender balance in wealth, gender balance sports coverage, etc. Such balance is essential for economies and communities to thrive. However, we all know that the challenges ahead are enormous. Today, we will talk about these challenges through the insights provided by our panelists. I would now like to introduce my panelists and would appreciate if they come on stage as their name is called out. Ms. Sadia Khan. 
Sadia has pursued a versatile career path traversing investment banking, financial regulation, family business across three continents with master's degree in economics from both Cambridge and Yale University. She has worked with various international institutions and local regulatory authorities including the Asian Development Bank in Philippines, the Securities Exchange Commission of Pakistan, the State Bank of Pakistan. Currently, she is the CEO of Selad Enterprises, a company founded in 2011 while working as a group executive director in her family-owned business, Delta Shipping. For the past two decades, Sadia has remained a passionate advocate of corporate governance and currently serves on various boards as an independent director, including Pakistan Cables, Engro Fertilizer, Karan Das, Habib Bank, Siemens, and INSEAD. Her book entitled Corporate Governance Landscape of Pakistan was published in 2017. In 2014 the French government conferred on her the prestigious award Knight of the National Order of Merit. Sadia is the president of Global NCAD Alumni Association since 2015. She also serves as the honorary council general of Finland in Karachi. Thank you Sadia for joining us today. Ms Farheen Salman Farheen joined Unilever as a management trainee in 1998 right out of college. She has worked in a number of categories across both home and personal care leading brands like Lux, Fair and Lovely and Lifeboy. She then joined the Walls ice cream business and has head of marketing and sales. Farheen spent 2014-15 in Turkey as brand development director. She worked with the global team and crafted an innovation and communication program that was instrumental in bringing the ice cream big business back to sustained double digit growth. She joined Unilever Pakistan board upon her return in 2016 as food and refreshments lead and has been the proud winner of 8 PS awards last year. Farheen is a mother of two boys and she believes her life is extremely energetic due to two pre-teens in her life. Farheen prides herself on her purpose of life which is unapologetic drive to create a wow balance. Thank you Farheen for joining us today. Our next panelist is Ms Saira Khan. Saira has nearly two decades of experience in the field of human resources management. Her professional alumina was Unilever, where her seven years in various local and international roles paved the way for her future growth. From there onwards, she has demonstrated strong leadership skills along with the ability to partner with senior management to create profitable solutions. Her penchant for risk and exploration took her through various industries and roles, allowing her to polish both her EQ and IQ while constantly building on core HR skills. Empowering uh, as a team leader and mentor, Saira was appointed as Director of Human Resources for National Foods in 2014. Motivated and successful, she has been leading the human resources and industrial relations realms at National Foods Limited while feeding her addiction for shoe shopping. Thank you, Saira. We strongly believe that no discussion about women empowerment or gender balance is complete without having representation from men. we consider them as partners rather than adversaries and hence my remaining two panelists are from the opposite gender mr faraz khan faraz is a uk based pakistani social entrepreneur investor published author and public speaker he is regarded as a leading authority on social entrepreneurship and believes in bringing a positive change in society with forward thinking business models that allow him to fulfill a personal commitment to improve the lives of people in the uk pakistan and beyond He launched Pakistan's first social enterprise fund with the British Council in five countries namely Brazil, Egypt, Indonesia, South Africa and Pakistan. Faraz is considered an authority in social enterprise ecosystem development. He is a member of Catalyst UKTI and sits on the advisory board of all party parliamentary group for entrepreneurship. He advises governments, corporates, investors and startups on ecosystems and social enterprise development. Faraz was nominated as one of the 100 senior leaders from 53 commonwealth countries in his royal high is duke of edinburgh commonwealth leadership program he has also been nominated as a future leader of the year by power 100 uk and nominated by the asia society to represent pakistan in young leaders conference thank you faraz for joining us today last but not the least is mr asim siddiqui asim is the country managing partner for ey pakistan prior to taking this position he led the transaction advisory services team in pakistan and also served as a member of the executive board of the firm since 2011 He qualified as a chartered accountant in 1993 from England and Wales and became member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Pakistan in 1996. Asim joined the firm as a manager audit in 1994 and quickly rose through the ranks. He was inducted as a partner in 1997. In 1998 he was assigned to develop advisory services and by 2000 had established business risk services and transaction advisory services. Since 2007 Asim has been leading the TS practice and has positioned EY at one of the leading transaction practices in Pakistan. We'd now like to start the panel discussion, and I'll take my seat over there. Can I have the mic?
Okay, so that was a lengthy introduction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, they do. If you press them, they do. No, they'll work now. They'll work now with the red light. Okay. So if I could start with you, Sadia. Sure. You know, we've seen like in any school or college, if you see the top position holders or the gold medalists, you come mm -hmm. across so many, so many girls and women. Mm -hmm. So, but when you come to the professional life, there's such dwindling statistics about women pursuing their professional careers. What do you think is the reason? And how, how can we counteract this menace, I would say? <laughs> sure. I mean, first of all, let me thank you for perching us on these thrones. It's reminding a lot of us <laughs> of our wedding day, but... Oh. <laughs> Um, but um, that's a very interesting question, and uh, tell me how long I have, because so that's the, if like I start talking about impediments... Four minutes per question. Uh, okay, so I'll try not to exceed that. But what I'd like to do while describing the impediments... By the way, uh, is the, can you hear me at the back? Is this okay, or should I lean further in? Great. So let's look at a typical journey that a female undertakes when she graduates from uh, college, having undertaken her studies against you, she family opposition or from the extended family. So she already has had to work twice as hard to try and prove herself and uh, full of hope and aspiration. Can everybody hear Sadia? At the back? Yeah, I saw a hand up. Uh, is this better? No echo? Great. Okay, now I can relax as well. Um, so as I was saying, that once you've graduated from college, and I'm going to walk through a typical journey, it's a bit stereotypical, but I think let's just look at all the imped impediments that can come your way once you've entered the workforce. So full of ambition and full of hope, you go in for your first interview, and you're faced with most often than not a panel full of men, similar to the first row over here. Uh, but of course, contrary to what we have present here, there's a lot of unconscious bias present in those all-male panels. And what happens is there's a checklist of the criteria that they're looking for, and more often than not, that selection criteria is looking for mirror images of themselves. For better or for worse, I say if it's all female cast as well, the same thing will happen. So going back to what Ellen said earlier, it's very important to have gender balanced interview panels to ensure that all perspectives are taken into account when hiring as a first level. So miraculously, if she manages to pass that first level uh, and has made an offer, she's too humble to even negotiate her first salary. So the pay gap already comes in from the very beginning. Uh, she begins working, 90% of the workforce around her are men. Uh, her boss, if he's nice enough, will give her some projects to do. If not, he'll probably keep telling her, you're going to get married soon. Why should I waste my energy training you or developing your talents when you're going to leave me in a few years? Uh, that, of course, sets her back again. Um, if the inevitable happens. She does get married, lo and behold. Um, and if her in-laws are good enough and her husband gives her, quote-unquote, permission to keep working, then she inevitably ends up with two jobs, one in the workforce and one at home. Because God forbid that her husband should lift even one finger to help with the domestic chores. So now I mean, I'm giving a stereotypical example because obviously there are many different variations of this, but I'm just showing you the many different impediments that comes along a woman's career. Um, having done those two jobs for, for many years and worn herself out, and at the same time increasing the pay gap at work and not being appreciated, uh, finally the kids come along and now she doesn't have two jobs, she has three jobs because God forbid that somebody should <laughs> raise a finger to help raise the child. Um, and this is worse than if there are no um, uh, uh, child care centers at work uh, or flexi hours uh, offered by the corporation she happens to work in. Uh, so it progressively worsens over time to the point that she's so tired and exhausted that inevitably you see this not a pyramid that you talk about like the Giza pyramids, but really the Burj Khalifa, a very steep curve where people are really, the women are dropping off the workforce because of this sheer burden of not just having to tolerate what's happening in the workforce, whether it's pay gap, whether it's sexual harassment, whether it's not being taken seriously, but also contending with the many different issues that come up uh, at the home front as well. Uh, so, I mean, there's so many impediments that Ellen uh, highlighted a few, including the panel, uh, panels that are composed largely of the same gender, as well as transportation issues. So we have to consider all these while formulating gender-specific uh, policies that corporations can uh, 
uh, implement to try and have a more conducive work environment for women, not just to survive but flourish at the workplace. That's so true and you covered about like, you know, how a woman has to get married and have children also. So coming to you, Farin, I just read in your profile that you have two pre 